You want to help come with this or with your lapel? Okay, good evening. A real pleasure being with you. Uh, first off, I have to recognize the guy that told me about this group like a year ago, but I'm embarrassed as all heck because I have gray hair and something happens with the memory when the hair turns gray. <laughs> so good buddy, please. Here I am. Okay. He and I belong to a war discussion group, and once a month we meet and discuss the wars from the Civil War all the way up, and I guess now we're on World War II and uh, Battle of the Bulge, something like that. But uh, I'd like to introduce my fellow Tuskegee Air ladies and men, and I'll start off by first introducing our Tuskegee lady, Naomi Fundenberg, who is the widow She is the widow of Fred Fundenberg, who flew missions over in, um, over in Italy. Our president, Richard Armistead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Fred Fundenberg was one of our casualties in the, in the war in Europe. Uh, Henry Moore. You belong, you belong to organizations, and in each organization there's somebody that always keeps you straight or tries. <laughs> Henry Moore was one of a total of only 64 black crew chiefs. Uh, he served in three of the four all-black squadrons in the 332nd Fighter Group from 1943 to 1944. Uh, on the table in the back, there's a flyer about Tuskegee Airmen, and on the opposite side, it talks about the enlisted men. And that's something that's rarely talked about with Tuskegee Airmen, and I hope I want to tell you more, more about that as I go along. Uh, John Harrison. John Harrison is a command pilot, 10,000 hours. Um, <laughs> He's flown how many different airplanes? You can't even count them anymore. 14 Air Force type planes. 14 Air Force type planes. 10,000 hours, what, 20 years? 23. 23 years and a, a colonel. Um, <laughs> Stafford Carr was an operations officer. He kept, uh, kept everything going smoothly and made sure that we knew the right places to go and, and got. How long were you in Stafford? Four, four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. with, uh, okay. with Tuskegee Airmen, well, first of all, Tuskegee Airmen exist because there was extreme racial segregation during World War II. That's why Tuskegee Airmen exist. I want to talk to you about Tuskegee Airmen, but I also want to talk about the history of blacks in aviation and even the history of blacks in the military. You know, history, his story. Whoever has the power of the pen and the press determine what's written down as history. And it is all, not always parallel with the facts that went on back then. So a lot of what is read and taught in school as history is like Swiss cheese. Holes all through it. And where black people are concerned, the holes become gaps. This is why we have Black History Month in our poor attempt to set the record straight. But in the, um, so far as wars are concerned, black men have fought in every war this country ever had. As a matter of fact, the first person to die for this country was a black man by the name of Crispus Attucks. The British were, were quartering soldiers up, up in New England, up in Boston, and there was a revolt against the British, which was the first skirmish of the Revolutionary War. And the first person to die in that skirmish was Crispus Attucks. In Boston, there's a statue, a monument to, uh, to Crispus Attucks. During the Revolutionary War, 
One in seven soldiers in George Washington's army was a black man. There were black soldiers at Valley Forge. There's now a monument to the black soldiers at Valley Forge. And there's also uh, efforts being made to set, put up a Patriots monument on the mall in Washington, DC. There's a commemorative coin uh, that you can buy but I think it's a dollar coin for $35, but most of the money goes to pay for the, uh, to pay for the monument. Uh, when I was a youngster coming up in school, reading school books, the only black people I saw were those that were in chains. I knew nothing about what black people did to establish this country, started with, with the Revolutionary War. During the War of 1812, uh, blacks were primarily in the Navy during the War of 1812. Uh, and the Navy was integrated at that time. I'm very anxious to see the contents of this submarine that they just brought up from the Civil War. Because during that time, blacks were a part of the Navy. And very often the onerous jobs, the very dangerous jobs, the dirty jobs were, where blacks were permitted to do those. So I'm anxious to see what's in that, what's in that submarine. During uh, the Civil War, 180 to 200,000 black men fought for the North during the Civil War. 180,000. Lincoln said the North could not have prosecuted the war without those black soldiers. And they acquitted themselves quite well during the war. Many of you may have seen the movie Glory. All right, that was the movie of one battle that the 54th Massachusetts took part. We counted 204 battles, Civil War battles, in which black soldiers took a part. And, and they did a, made a very good record for themselves during the Civil War. Um, during the Spanish-American War, there are some things that have to be corrected in history. You know, Spanish-American War, we get Teddy Roosevelt, San Juan Hill, and all that stuff. Well, the facts are a little different than the popular history. I mean, we like to romanticize. We like to make things all look good and pretty. But that's not always the fact. Um, the 24th Regiment had a great deal to do with capturing San Juan Hill. Uh, Roosevelt was involved in capturing Kelly Hill, but San Juan Hill was a little different story. So you have to do a lot of investigating in the history to find out the truth about that. Uh, comes World War I, the notion is see, they've forgotten all the stuff that happened in the past. You know, Shakespeare said that the good that men do is often turned with their bones. But it happens that the good that black men do is interred on the spot. They don't wait for any bones. Whatever black men do good, Stamp it out, don't show it, forget about it. So it comes World War I, they have forgotten about the valor of black soldiers in those past wars. And the United States during World War I is using black soldiers primarily as laborers. You know, shovel up behind the mules in those days, dig the trenches, unload the boxcars, bury the dead, all that kind of stuff. Uh, black soldiers were not even under arms for the most part during World War I. Except for the 69th Regiment, the Harlem Hellfighters, they were lent to a, a French commander who used them as fighting men. The French did not have slavery. They didn't have all the racism that the United States had. The French had the, uh, the Foreign Legion, and they were thoroughly familiar with the abilities and history of blacks as fighting men because they had to fight them many times in Africa and elsewhere. So the French used the 69th Regiment under arms as fighting men. The 69th Regiment spent more time on the front lines in the trenches than any other regiment during the war. The French government awarded the quarter gear to the entire, to the entire regiment. But in the United States, it was an entirely different story because everything is based upon white superiority and black inferiority and slavery and all that stuff, so the whole thing gets all fouled up. After the war, there was a, um, a, a manpower study, and a secret report was uh, written, and this comes from the Freedom of Information Act. And some of the things in this secret, this secret report, this um, analysis of the Negro, just a couple things here, uh, they were very low in the scale of human evolution. Cranial cavity is smaller than whites. The brain, their brain weighs 35 ounces. The white brain weighs 45 ounces. The Negro is unmoral, lacks physical courage, unable to control emotions beyond a certain point. <clears throat> His psychology is such that we cannot expect to draw leadership material 
from his race. And it goes on and on and on, that kind of business. That was in 1925. However, in 1921, ah, we gotta get to, we gotta get the first black fighter pilot first. Uh, during World War I, uh, a young black man by the name of Eugene Bullard, who lived outside of Columbus, Georgia, had the misfortune of seeing his grandfather lynched. And uh, that was extremely troubling to him. But his father told him that, uh, you know, trying to calm him down, don't despair, son. There's a land across the ocean where they treat black men primarily the same as white men. So Eugene Bullard had to do something. So he ran away from home, got on a ship that he thought was going to France, but the ship left him off in England. And in England, he worked in a circus, he worked as a boxer, he, was a, he did all kinds of things there in a living, but eventually he did get to France. In 1917, he got to France, he joined the French Foreign Legion, then he learned that he could go to flying school. African American in France can go to flying school in 1917. In this country, they want to let you carry a gun. So Eugene Boulard uh, became a pilot in the French uh, Air Force. This is the first black African American fighter pilot. He flew for the French and he lived in France for like 30 years after, uh, after the war. Women always get into things. Whenever you find something good around, you can bet women are gonna come in and God bless them. Yeah. This young lady, <laughs> this young lady's name is Bessie Coleman. Uh, her home was in Texas, but she moved to Chicago for better opportunities. And her brothers used to tease her about black women can't do the good things that white women do. All black women do is do hair and scrub floors and that kind of, white women are flying airplanes and they do this and so, and Bessie Coleman became very incensed and she was determined that she was gonna do it. So Bessie Coleman saved her money, learned French and with the help of the publisher of the uh, Chicago Defender, in 1921, Bessie Coleman went to France. They wouldn't teach blacks to fly in this country. Bessie Coleman went to France and got her pilot's license and returned to this country in 1922, and she would fly around the countryside giving lessons, encouraging uh, black youth to take part in aviation. There were a number of flying clubs uh, started as a result of, of Bessie Coleman's efforts. One of the flying clubs out on the West Coast, there were two guys in 1932. They flew from California to New York in 1932. Fred, uh, Herman Banning and his mechanic, Thomas Allen. Pilots always flew with a mechanic. Those things always went wrong. Somebody had the wire and the bubble gum to paste them back together. But it took, um, it took 41 hours and 27 minutes to get from California to New York. In 1920, in the late 20s, there was a young man that lived in, um, in Bryn Mawr, just up the road a piece. This young man had the flying bug and it's so deep in his heart, he would even leave, if he heard there was an airplane in any place around here, he'd leave home and go to wherever this airplane was. And he would always look and watch and listen and dream. So this guy, you know they talked about the, the small craniums of black people? This guy had a real small one. He had the audacity to buy an old airplane and teach himself to fly. Charles Alfred Anderson. The first time Anderson was in an air, up in an airplane, he was all by himself. He taught himself to fly. And he was still flying at age 86. He became the chief instructor pilot at Tuskegee, and um, he's the guy, I'll tell you later on, that Eleanor Roosevelt flew around Tuskegee with, Charles Alfred Anderson. In, 19, in the middle 20s, in the middle 30s rather, um, two guys flew down to Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, Dale White and, um, okay, the name, other name will come to me. But at any rate, they flew down to Washington, D.C. to try to get support from congressmen to let blacks into the Army Air Corps. They've already deemed they're unfit to be soldiers, let alone pilots, forget it. They can't fly airplanes. Forget Bessie Coleman, forget these guys, forget all this. Don't forget whatever blacks do, bury it. So they're saying blacks can't fly, so they wouldn't admit blacks to the Air Corps. But these two men flew down to Washington, D.C., and they met with um, junior senator, junior senator Harry Truman and Everett Dirksen. 
And uh, Senator Truman said, look, you guys flew from here down to, from Chicago down to here. Uh, the other guy's name was Chauncey Spencer. He wrote a book. Who was Chauncey Spencer by Chauncey Spencer? But at any rate, Harry Truman said, I'll do whatever I can to, you know, to get you guys going. There was another young man who figured that I'm going to go to West Point. Now, if I can get through West Point, there's no way in the world the Air Corps can tell me that I don't have what it takes to be a pilot. This young man's name was Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. He entered West Point in 1932. He was the only black cadet at West Point at that time, and they tried to make him quit. They tried to force him out. During the four years that he was at West Point, no one spoke to him. During the four years. Now, normally you have, when you're in school, you're in West Point, you have roommates. And you and your roommates study together, you relax together, you encourage each other, you help each other. No one would room with Benjamin O. Davis. He was alone. They had dancing classes. He even had to learn to dance by himself. At least he didn't step on any ladies' toes while he was doing it. On weekends, you know, during the week, the squads march in and they go to their table and they all have a place to sit and eat. On weekends, it's sort of free time. And they could sit any place where if an upperclassman would permit them to. No one would permit Benjamin Davis to sit. So on weekends, if he stayed on, on West Point's campus, he ate in a corner or, or someplace else. At the end of the four years, 1936, at graduation time, out of 276 cadets, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. was number 35, top 13% of the class. But he still didn't get in the Air Corps. The Air Corps would not admit blacks. In 1939, the government started a um, civilian pilot training program. They realized that they would need pilots for what appeared to be a definite war on the horizon. So in 1939, they started a civilian pilot training program, and there were six black colleges that had these programs. Uh, Howard, Hampton, Tuskegee, West Virginia State, Delaware State, I think North Carolina. There were six uh, altogether at any rate. A young man by the name of um, Yancey Williams got his pilot's wings from uh, Howard University, and he sued the Army for admission to the, uh, to the Air Corps. And with that lawsuit, and with some politics going on there, re-elections, you know what politicians do when it's time to get re-elected, they all kinds of promises, we all know how that works. Well, at any rate, they designated, um, they started one of, they gave the blacks one of these flying schools, and with that, they agreed to start a, uh, a, a class for blacks as, uh, uh, as pilots. Now, before the pilots got started, they had the mechanics. Had the mechanics had to be trained. You can't fly an airplane unless the thing is, is airworthy. So they started the um, mechanics classes out in... Um, Chanute Field. Chanute Field. Field, Chanute Field, Illinois. A lot of, lot, of these, lot of these things don't come to me so fast. But, Eleanor Roosevelt, like Hillary, played an important part in this. Tuskegee had the flying field. They had a flying program. But they needed a larger field because they wanted to start teaching secondary flying, secondary civilian flying. So they borrowed money from the Judas Rosenwald Fund. And it just happens that Eleanor Roosevelt was on the board of the Judas Rosenwald Fund. And she went to Tuskegee, and while there, she decided to fly with one of these black pilots. You know, they had said that blacks can't fly and blacks couldn't do this. And black, so Eleanor Roosevelt said, I want to see for myself. So Eleanor Roosevelt flew with Charles Alfred Anderson, who was the guy that taught himself to fly. This is now 1941. Alfred taught himself to fly back in the late 20s. He had a commercial pilot's license by the middle 30s. So Tuskegee started the first class in 1941, the fall of 1941. In the spring of 1942, the first class of black pilots was graduated from the advanced flying school to Tuskegee. There were five, only five guys in that class. Uh, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. was one of them. By this time, he's a captain. He came out of West Point as a second, but second lieutenant. By this time, he's a captain, so he's a senior officer. They made him in charge of the squadron. And by uh, like September of 42, they finally had enough men to form a squadron. The first squadron was the uh, 99th Fighter Squadron. 
And I'd like to show you some videotape that would help um, illustrate some of what went on. Let me carefully here. That's about it. That's about as far as it'll go from that plug. Can you start it? Training under a segregated system made it difficult for those who did. Some of the uh, white pilots, instructor pilots, in the basic and advanced schools did not want a lot of black people to get through flying school. So there were at least as many qualified, competent black pilots in our classes who were washed out because of some technicality, because the, apparently the master plan was not to let too many black pilots become successful, not to let this quote unquote experiment become successful. While the waiting period for white applicants for flying training was only a few weeks, some blacks had to wait as long as three years. I had gone to the course and graduated as a pilot completely. Anyway, they came there, there was a colonel and a lieutenant, they were white, and they had us all, 20 of us, all come over and line up and go down in line and say, yes, I want to join your outfit or not, see? My time came. When I got there, he says, what the hell are you doing in line? And he stunned me. But I recovered and I said, I'm here to join with my buddies to fight for the United States. And he said, get the hell out of line. Uncle Sam ain't taking no night fighters. And so that hurt deeply. And uh, but it, I said, I'm not going to quit. We were faced in a segregated situation, fighting in a segregated situation. And we were fighting against a racist power, the Axis powers, but in a segregated situation. So we had two things to prove. We had to prove, first of all, that we could do what they said that we could not do. And secondly, that we could do it under these, uh, under these circumstances, which we did. And that created a bond of camaraderie, uh, a bond of, of togetherness uh, that lasted throughout the years. You know, even going through cadets, you know, the white folks didn't want us to get through uh, cadets. Many a night, I think, uh, uh, and I know I've done this, that we've had some, some, some fellows that have some tough time, and we set up with them all night long and hold them in our arms to give them the strength to get through. I get emotional about that, I'm sorry. It wasn't easy. They trained classes about every four and a half weeks. They would enter some more people into training. But they'd established a rigid quota, both for entrance into the training and also for how many would graduate. But the ball got away from them a bit in that we had started producing more than could possibly be used in one single squadron. All the while the 99th was training, they had become, they had graduated, they had filled up the squadron to its limit, and these men had trained, they had done their tactical training in P-40 Warhawk aircraft. With small bombs fastened to the wings of their P-40s, the pilots dive in low over the ground, release the bombs, and speed away in a sweeping curve as the bombs skip into the target. During the cadet, the cadet training program, I was one of the uh, gunnery instructors for the cadet program, which meant that we uh, were teaching the, the cadets uh, air-to-air gunnery and uh, air-to-ground gunnery. Most of the enlisted men uh, had a great deal of respect for the cadets and for those who had already graduated after the, after the first classes started to graduate. And of course, uh, we respected them for the abilities that they had, and they respected us for the abilities that we had. Um, we were military, we were proper, we saluted the officers, uh, except on the flight line. Things were a little lax on the flight line, and you almost, almost got to call people either by their first name or their last name. But 
with all the with all the other military around, the, the 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 white military officers and so forth, we had to keep a pretty sharp eye out and, and not do anything that was going to disgrace anybody. By August 5, 1942, the 99th Fighter Squadron had a full cadre of pilots. On August 21, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. replaced Captain George Spanky Roberts as the commander of the 99th. The 99th was declared ready for combat in late September 1942. A variety of problems created a series of delays in getting an overseas assignment. For example, out of fear of racial problems, foreign governments, including the African nation of Liberia, and Air Force theater commanders did not want the pioneer black squadron. In spite of pressure from the black press and civil rights groups, including Judge William Hastie's resignation from the War Department, it seemed that the Air Force experiment to test black pilots in combat would fail because the 99th, on whose shoulder the future of black air units depended, would never get overseas. While the men of the 99th waited to fight, the battle in North Africa escalated. On the Russian front, the Germans were meeting their Waterloo at Stalingrad. By January 1943, the Germans had permanently lost their initiative to the Russians. It was a major turning point in the war. By this time, Tuskegee Army Airfield had a new commanding officer, Colonel Noel Parrish. Although he made no substantial changes in the segregation pattern, he was perceived as more sensitive. But in the beginning, there was an attitude of uh, many people, including the previous commander, the one just ahead of me. And he felt that uh, he was expected to let this thing fail. Uh, it was a hopeless situation. Uh, the handicaps of the black men there would be so great anyway. And with the war on, they didn't want to take time and worry about it and uh, so forth. But uh, for the, those of us who were assigned there, we managed to develop the feeling, which I think was just a simple one and not the traditional one at the time, the feeling that uh, we had to produce something and help. And, and uh, the men we had with us were willing to learn to fly and to fight and would go over and do their share. And we would have made our contribution the best we could to the war, along with the men there. While Colonel Parrish settled into his new position, the black community continued its outcry against the War Department's lack of action in sending the 99th overseas, led by the Pittsburgh Courier's Double V campaign. But the imminent Anglo-American invasion of North Africa became an Air Force priority. And after two years of training and delays, the Tuskegee Flyers of the 99th were ordered overseas to the Mediterranean theater of operations. It was very clear that the 99th was an experimental unit to test the performance of blacks in aerial combat. Finally, the chance had come. When we arrived at uh, Casablanca, we, uh, very shortly thereafter, we were transported to uh, a place fairly close to Fez in uh, Morocco. We, uh, did a month there of uh, flying our P-40Ls, which were delivered to us about that time. We were welcomed by the North African Tactical Air Force, uh, General Cannon, who was in command at that time. Within three weeks after the 99th arrived in North Africa, Tunisia was captured by the Allies. The unit was under the control of the 33rd Fighter Group. The North African campaign had ended, and the next step was Italy. But Sicily blocked the road to Italy, and the small island of Pantelleria led the way to Sicily. It was at this period that the 99th received its first taste of war. Our first missions were sort of like sky police. We were flying from the tip of Cape Bon in Africa, and our air forces were bombing the little island of Pantelleria. And we were supposed to sit out and 
sort of form a circle around which the bombers made their runs in order to hit the target. And that was our, really our first experience. We saw enemy aircraft above. We were to stay where we were unless they attacked. They did not attack. They went away. And so we had no uh, initial contact with them. On June 9th, a flight of the squadron's planes sighted a group of 12 Focke Wolf 190 interceptors, escorting about 18 bombers headed for the Allied invasion forces. As the novice black pilots climbed to meet the enemy, the Germans peeled off at 12,000 feet and, at more than 400 miles per hour, broke the 99th's formation. This tactical error on the part of the 99th, the result of inexperience, would come back to haunt them when charges of poor combat performance would be made. Between May 18 and June 11, about 6,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Pantelleria. The aerial attack on the island ended June 11, when the city surrendered, marking the first time a city fell to air power alone. The island of Lampedusa fell on June 12. Now the Allied forces turned their attention to the island of Sicily, the gateway to Italy. The 99th was given the assignment to escort medium bombers to the western section of Sicily on July 1st. The next day, July 2nd, 1943, was historic. A former Sunday school teacher from Brazil, Indiana, Lieutenant Charles Hall, became the first black combat pilot to destroy an enemy plane in aerial combat. Hall's victory was a cause for great joy and a definite boost to the sagging morale of the 99th. The Allied commander, General Dwight Eisenhower, congratulated him personally and commended the unit. The invasion of Sicily was planned for July 7th. Three days later, the first wave of troops stormed the beaches. The 99th was responsible for guarding the fleet against attack by enemy aircraft. The Sicily operation was a tactical air operation. Uh, we subsequently moved to Gala. We were based there. And uh, we uh, conducted strikes against um, enemy targets, usually uh, gun emplacements, in support of uh, our own ground forces along the northern coast of Sicily. Whenever the, uh, uh, our forces were moving, we were usually out in front of them attacking those forces. That was a highly successful operation. Um, it was a, an unglamorous uh, operation. It was uh, but a very essential one. And I think at the contribution of the 99th and the uh, support of ground forces, not only made, created the way for our forces to move uh, finally to the uh, uh, domination of the island, but it also gave us a lot of training that we were to use for great, ad to great advantage in uh, at later time. Following the Sicilian campaign, the Allies made plans to invade Italy. During this time, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Davis was recalled stateside in August 1943 to take command of the 332nd Fighter Group. The 99th was shuttled around from one white fighter group to another. The 99th was attached to the 79th Fighter Group for the invasion of Italy. After Davis left, there were rumors that the 99th would be reassigned to non-combat coastal duties. The 99th was still flying these, primarily flying these close support missions, and they weren't, uh, they weren't getting any aerial victories. And in these days, uh, the, the air heroes were the guys that were shooting down the enemy airplane. And so there became quite a controversy regarding the 99th, and a very, very bad press, not only bad press, but within the military circles themselves, 
of the white commanders of the group that they were with uh, and their assessment, as well as the, the theater commander, that uh, got the general impression that they, they, were, they, were, they were not uh, energetic or, or they were not uh, aggressive enough, but proved by the fact that they had shot down any airplanes, disregarding the fact the good that they were doing with this ground support and failing to, failing to, to bring this out as a reason of justification, and got things so muddled that there was a great big controversy back in the States about whether they should let them continue. An article in, appeared in Time magazine uh, describing a report about the operation of the 99th during its first three months of combat. And this report uh, indicated uh, by comparison a performance by the 99th that was less than equal to the performance of um, white pursuit squadrons. Colonel William Momeyer, commander of the 33rd, confirmed rumors of dissatisfaction with the 99th. He also added in a report that their formation flying disintegrated in combat and suggested that they avoided well-guarded targets. Based on the performance of the 99th Fighter Squadron, it is my opinion that they are not of the fighting caliber of any squadron in this group. They have failed to display the aggressiveness and desire for combat that are necessary to a first-class fighting organization. A series of theater commanders agreed with Momeyer and General Edwin House, commander of the 12th Air Support Command, recommended that the 99th be removed from combat and given routine convoy duties. On many discussions held with officers of all professions, the consensus of opinion seems to be that the Negro type has not the proper reflexes to make a first-class fighter pilot. General Henry Arnold, the commander of the Army Air Forces, hailing the report as a fair analysis and the Army Air Forces headquarters concurred in the recommendations. But this decision to move the 99th to a rear defense area was met by a report from General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Allied commander later to become President of the United States, which pointed out that the 99th had successfully carried out difficult missions. One of the primary reasons that the, the 99th wasn't getting uh, kills in the beginning uh, was due to the, the type of work uh, that was assigned to them. And I'm speaking of close support, uh, what we call interdiction work where they do dive bombing and strafing uh, uh, up near the enemy front lines uh, of the ground troops. And therefore, they didn't come in contact with, with enemy aircraft. They weren't in the area where the enemy aircraft were. They were further back behind the lines. I testified before uh, more than one committee in the, in the Pentagon. I held a press conference in the Pentagon at their request. Colonel and, Davis uh, testified that there was an initial lack of confidence and that mistakes were made as a result of inexperience. However, he denied that formation disintegration was a common occurrence. He cited the one incident of June 9th. He insisted that his pilots could match skills with the white pilots. In fact, an Army report concluded that there was no significant difference between the performance of the 99th and white squadrons. A decision was made to extend the experiment. The decision to take the 99th out of combat was reversed. Plans to develop the black 332nd Fighter Group went ahead. The group left for the Mediterranean Theater on January 3rd, 1944. In effect, the experiment had been enlarged. It now entered the final stage. While the 99th participated in the Italian invasion, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. was whipping the 332nd Fighter Group into shape at Selfridge Field near Detroit. On January 3, 1944, the group left for the Mediterranean. We got the 332nd ready, and uh, in December 1943, we moved to Camp A.P. Hill and got aboard a, a ship and uh, went to Toronto, Italy, uh, landed there, 
moved to uh, Monte Carvino, Italy, and the mud and cold Italian winter, which was pretty hard to take. And uh, we operated uh, for a while there within the Coastal Command, out of Capitano, out of uh, which was, is the main uh, air base for the uh, city of Naples. Um, this Coastal Commission, uh, or rather Coastal Mission, also was not a glamorous mission. Uh, the 79th in the meantime, was operating 79th Group. In the meantime, was operating uh, the 99th Squadron. The 99th Squadron, experts without any question whatsoever on the basis of 11 months of tactical operations. There wasn't any better squadron in the whole Mediterranean Allied Air Force. The battle to conquer Italy was underway. Plans were made by the Allies to speed the way to Rome. The next target was the Enzio Natuno area, 30 miles south of Rome. The Allies landed at Enzio on January 22, 1944. They were met by strong Luftwaffe opposition. After six months in combat, the black flyers of the 99th had shot down only one German plane. But new assignments brought greater contact with enemy planes. On January 27, 1944, the tide nearly two to one, the 99th shot down five enemy aircraft in less than five minutes. And on the same day, on another mission, the Tuskegee Airmen scored three more aerial victories. The following day, the 99th's winning streak continued. Four more German planes were destroyed. By February 10th, Pioneer Black Squadron had destroyed 17 enemy aircraft with four probables and damaged six, but they had lost eight men in the process. On February 17th, it was three more aerial victories. They were finally convinced that black men could fly airplanes and fight in combat. When the 332nd um, went into operation, they first gave them P-39s. A P-39 is one of the slowest, unmaneuverable things. The only thing going for it was it had a cannon in the nose, and they used that to shoot up tanks. They gave that to the 332nd first. Then the 332nd was, was transferred to, from the 12th Air Force to the 15th Air Force, and they were, the commanders there were losing airplanes right and left. You know, there are 10, like 10 men in a bomber. When a B-17 or a B-24 goes down, 10 guys go down with it. And we were losing bombers by the dozens. I recall my father, when I told him I wanted to be a pilot, he showed me the headlines, 100 bombers lost. How, why do you want to go in and do that kind of dumping? They're getting shot down like flies. Well, we were losing a fantastic number of airplanes because most of the fighter squadrons, when they went up on an escort mission, the guys were concerned about becoming aces. You have to shoot down five planes to become an ace. So the guys want to become aces. So instead of staying with the bombers, they would leave the bombers to chase Germans around the sky, and then the bombers are left unprotected, and they get done in. 
So the commander of the 15th Air Force asked Colonel Davis if his group uh, could do escort work. And Colonel Davis, West Point man, fantastic soldier, certainly we can do escort work. So they gave them some old P-47s. Now the P-47 is a very rugged airplane, eight, uh, eight machine guns, the thing weighed seven tons, but it was a gas guzzler. And it couldn't do uh, long range escort missions. I recall uh, a story by um, the guy's last name is Muirhead. Oh, the name of the title of the book is Those Who Have Those Who Have Fallen. And in one or two pages there, he talks about uh, these P-47s with red tails escorting bombers through the flak all the way up to the target and out. The standard procedure for the other squadrons is when you get near the IEP, the initial point where you're going to start dropping bombs, you bug out and wait for the bombers to go in and come back and then you meet them on the way out. But he was surprised that these novice dumb guys with these red tail P-47s staying with the bombers all the way to the target through the flak and coming back out with them. Uh, I think he did mention that they were novice black pilots or something of the sort. But the P-40, I saw some heads nodding, so some people have read that book. The P-47, a rugged plane, but the range was lousy. So they gave them P-51s. And the P-51s that were given to the 332nd fighter group at first were the old C models. They were the models that the other squadrons were getting rid of. So they gave them to the 332nd. And of course, these airplanes have the markings of these other squadrons on them. So the guys, you know, people think this red tail was some fantastic notion that somebody had. The planes had red tails because they used red paint to paint out the stuff that the other squadrons had. They had given them used airplanes, so they used red paint to paint over the other guy's stuff. And that's how they went into combat with the tails painted red. And it stuck. Later, they did get new model uh, P P-51s. But during escort work, in a year's time, over 200 different escort missions, not a single American bomber was shot down when they were being escorted by these small cranium, cranial guys with the lightweight brains. Not a single American bomber was lost when the red tails were escorting. Maybe some of you saw the movie, Tuskegee Airmen, the HBO video. In that movie, one of the uh, bomber squadrons is requesting uh, the red tail escort. Well, those guys are black. You want them? Hey, they got good records, man. You know, when, when you're saving somebody's butt, they don't care what your color is. It's later that, uh... but it happened so often that Colonel Davis named his airplane by request. Now, you can't tell how many people were saved. Remember now, there are 10 guys in each one of these airplanes. You can't tell how many were saved, but for each bomber that was saved, there were also 10 men's lives that were saved. Because there were you know, like 10 guys, maybe the 20, B-24 carried more, but like 10 guys in each one of, the, uh, one of the bombers. There's a guy by the name of Frank Connolly, white guy who was a gunner on a B-24. And he knew nothing about black pie, hadn't even seen any black guys during the war. But anyway, the old typical war story is B-24s all shot out, two engines are out, and there are bullet holes all in the thing, and they're losing altitude, trying to get back across the Adriatic so they can at least be in friendly territory. And they look up, and, and there's this, this airfield over there, and it's not even on the map. But anyway, they land, and they, the airplane stops, and they look around, and these jeeps of black guys come up, and everybody they see is black. Then they look over, and they see these red tail 51s. You guys are the ones that... That's how Frank Connolly learned that there were black pilots flying those airplanes. Uh, oxygen mask on here, goggles up here. You can't see what color the guy is. You can only go by how he flies his airplane. They call them red tail angels because those were the guys that got them back home. Many times there were bombers that were shot up and were, were, were straggling. The colonel would always have somebody go back and bring that guy home. 
And that's how these lightweight brain guys conducted themselves during the war. We feel that, well, we were, we're certain that the Air Force realized it was pretty stupid to have two separate Air Forces, extremely expensive to have two separate structures. So even before uh, President Truman signed the desegregation order, the Air Corps started, started integrating because they realized it was the best use of, uh, of personnel and there was no difference in the personnel. Although there were still some crazy things that happened. In 1949, uh, right, at, right as, just before desegregation, they had a, a gunnery meet out in one of the uh, airfields out in California. Cal I think it was California. Well, at any rate, you sent your each squadron sent its top guns out there. So the um, 332nd sent uh, four or five guys out there. They're flying P-47s, and you had to do aerial, aerial, aerial firing, uh, ground air. You had to shoot rockets and drop bombs and so forth. And this meet went on for a week, and you know they have a way of keeping score. You know you can the bullets have paint on them, and when you look at the target, uh, you count how many reds and how many blues and how many yellows, and that's the guy's score. So at the end of the meet, they totaled the whole thing up, and they published a list of the squadrons. Now you go into competition, there's third place, second place, first place, all that stuff. In this list, they have first place unknown. Have you ever in your life heard of anybody having a competition and they don't know who first place is? Well, we knew who first place was, and they later corrected the record. But these are the kinds of things that uh, you put up with during the war. You know, we were stationed at Wallaboro, South Carolina. Our friend here was a prisoner of war in Alcott, saw some place. At Wallaboro, South Carolina, we had German and Italian prisoners of war on our base. If they were taken in town on a detail, they would be served in town. We in army uniform, wings, breath, we couldn't be served in town during the war, fighting for liberty, democracy, and all that wonderful stuff. But our prisoners could. It's amazing how, thing, how things happen. Uh, I'd like for uh, Henry Moore to tell you something about how they managed to have such a fantastic record. You see, they said, one of the things they said was it would take too long to train blacks so the war would be over, it would be a waste of manpower. They even told the British, don't even bother trying to train Indians to be uh, mechanics because it takes 18 months. Henry was a crew chief, one of 60, 64. Tell them about the, let me give you, uh, let me give you this. I'm not as young as <laughs> Average age of the Tuskegee Airmen now is 79, and I'm 79. So I'm not as good as I think. Well, I break up sometime when I start telling any kind of story of what happened overseas, because uh, we have some fellas that won't come or go around on this circuit. We have one named, um, um, well, I won't call his name, but he won't follow us for, for that reason. And, I don't know exactly what the reason is, except that he's lost some buddies, as I did over there. And he's, as I was, when I first joined up with the Tuskegee Airmen group here, I just started crying. And I said, after trying, my wife said, well, you should just go on and join them. After 47 years or something like that, they had a group and I joined them. Well, it was on, to make this, this short, it was, it was in March uh, 1945, the longest flight that, uh, that the, the Tuskegee Airmen uh, went on over Berlin. It was maximum effort. Now there's four squadrons, four times 16 to 64 aircraft can we put up in all. We're talking about a small number of black folks in, in, in doing this overseas bit. That's as many as we ever put up at a time, about 60, 64, but we put up around 69 or 70 aircraft that the maximum effort, Colonel B.O. Davis there was our commanding officer, and he said, we're gonna do it. We're gonna prove that we can go up there and go to the target. We put on extra tanks, extra wing tanks underneath this P-51. There's 
no wing tanks underneath there. We put 150 gallons on each tank and we had 60 gallons here and 100, uh, well. We put enough fuel to, to, to go to 1,600 miles round trip and back. When all was said and done, we had lost some fellas, but we had shot down some people too. And five, 11 days after, after our, not after that flight, after the last flight of Tuskegee Airmen, the war ended, but on this flight, we returned with such proficiency and stayed with the bombers. And I want to say that that's a record. I don't know if you emphasize that. It's a record that, that uh, no squadron, no squadron uh, escorted bombers in World War II without the loss of a bomber, except the 332nd Fighter Group. That's a record. And it's one that pr probably will never be broken. Well, on the return, we. There's one medal that I managed to save out of all of my, my uh, medals, and I had quite a number. They were lost in fires. Even I, don't, I can't locate my 201 fire because it was lost in fire in, in St. Louis, in the Veterans Administration fire. I, I'm trying to write my memoirs, and I, I could be a major general. But of all the, really, but of all of the medals that followed me, I do have my discharge. I was in three of those squadrons, as I told you. I do have my discharge from the 100th Fighter Squadron. Just went over with the 302nd. Then was in the 99th most of the times, and then discharged in the 100th. I missed the 301st. Her husband was shot down in 301st. Of all the medals I managed to save, it followed me. That's this medal here. This is the Presidential Unit Citation that was given by Franklin D. Roosevelt shortly before he died, and it was awarded to us at Ramit Taylor Air Base, Air Force Base, by Harry S. Truman. This was the only presidential unit citation that the 332nd fighter group, per se, got. It had, the 99th had gotten two presidential citations. When they speak of the 99th, this was that pursuit squadron, which proved the way, and they did for us. When we got over there, the 99th was with the white squadron. There were three of us, three squadrons of us. And finally, they brought the, had to get all the colored folks together. That's what I say. The 99th was across the field at Ramitel Air Base, no, at the Capitachina Air Base, or across the field with another squad, another group, of all white group. And they couldn't stand to see the 99th flying with that all white group. That's what I say. And by the time we got over and did the escort work over there, we were very powerful. 4 times 16 is 64 aircraft that we put up every day. Once the 99th joined us, we were four squadrons. A group was usually only three squadrons. Three times 16, 48 aircraft, that's all we can put up. Well, they broke up my squadron, which was the best squadron, the 302nd Fighter Squadron. And of course, it was said that that was the best. Colonel Davis said he was gonna break up the best so that there won't be any complaints. And he scattered us, and I went, then is when I went to the 99th. Okay, I'm gonna have to make, cut this short because I know you have, some, have a time constraint. But get me started. And, uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never, never stop. I'll go through emotions, and after a while I might start crying and things like that, because if I start talking about those that I left over there. But that President's Unit Citation was the one thing that followed me, and somehow it stays with me. I said, well, I'm going to put it on this, this uniform that we use now. Um, I'm going to leave this up to you. Okay. And thank you very much for, for, for this time. During the course of the war, we flew four different airplanes, the P-39, the P-40, the P-47, the P-51, and all of the engineering and mechanical work was done by black mechanics. And it didn't take them 18 months or three years to learn. How long was well, mechanics school? Just tell me, give me a number. Just give me a number. <laughs> How long was school? Well, about 27 months, something like that. We, uh, but we covered, I want you to know, we studied 13 different aircraft from nose to, nose to, to tail, to wingtip to wingtip. And I can name them right now mm -hmm. if you want me to. No, nope, don't. No, it's okay. I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't take forever, it didn't take forever for black pilots to learn how to re redo aircraft as some people had predicted. During the course of the war, the group shot down 111 German aircraft in individual aerial combat. 
111. We lost 36 guys to all causes. And when you're a fighter pilot, there are a whole lot of ways that you can mess up your health record. And we lost 66 guys to all causes. This gives us about a two to one victory ratio over Hitler's super duper Aryans. These slowly evolving black guys with the small craniums over the super duper Aryans. We had a two to one victory ratio. Our squadron, our, our group also just sank a destroyer. 15th Air Force headquarters did not want to believe when we reported sinking a destroyer. But each time you pull the trigger on a fighter plane, the camera takes a picture. So two guys came back and they've got photographs, they've got film with this, air, with this aircraft carrier blowing up with, I'm sorry, this destroyer blowing up and sinking in, in the Adriatic. They were flying P-47s and they were returning from a mission, uh, Yugoslavia, someplace up there, and they're crossing the Adriatic and they see this, hey, it's not ours. So let's sip, so the boys, a uh, couple passes and the thing blew up and sank, and they sank a destroyer. Among many other things, um, on the blue board in the back, you'll see the, the score, all the sorties, all the missions, many of the things that were destroyed. But the thing that stands out most is the fact that 200 escort missions, not a single American bomber lost by enemy fighters. And heavens knows how many guys were, uh, were killed. Our president, Richard Armistead, do you want to uh, greet the group? He's a bashful guy, I'm telling you. You wonder how fighter pilots can be bashful. Man. I'd like to say I'm happy that so many of you have come tonight and this is like putting, reassembling something. Um, my memory's pretty good about Christmas Eve when I was a boy. We'd hear people laughing downstairs, which would be my parents, and they'd be putting things together for us to see. Now, the important thing about this putting things together, which we're doing here tonight, is for you to get some idea, better than an idea, some feelings, some understandings that there are all kinds of people in our country, and each one, when he's taught something, makes a tremendous um, thing come forward, a success. Uh, not so much for the individual, but for the whole team. And that's what this is all about, team. And it's not to make you feel ashamed or sad or anything like that, but it's to open the eye and the intellect and have some appreciation. And if you want to tie it in for religion, you'll see this. Um, the guy in the sky made us all. So why should he make one less important than the other? The other thing is this, uh, too much knowledge, because we all have backgrounds and we were taught thus and so, this must be taken step by step. And little by little, like a jigsaw puzzle or whatever, and you put it together, it's not what you thought it was. All the jumbled pieces in the box, and this is what we're doing here now, trying to help all the people who listen to us, not that we're so big, bad, and whatnot, but to see that there's some, everyone here, God does not make junk, but we junk it. Okay? All right. Hey, Stafford. Huh? No? Stafford passes. Uh, John Harrison, he's a guy with all these airplanes he flew in, 10,000 hours and all that stuff. Uh, thank you, Gene. Uh, Gene has told you a lot of things about uh, the history of Tuskegee Airmen and uh, some things you probably did not know. Uh, Henry Moore, uh, Gene probably had to catch him and put him back in his seat because when this guy get, starts talking, uh, he doesn't shut up. <laughs> so I am going to tell you two little stories. Uh, one involves Gene here. We were down at the airfield at Medford and uh, Gene had the pictures in the back on a round table and we were talking to people that came and looked at the pictures and explaining what this was about and what that was about. 
So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Gene, there was a 30, about a 30-year-old uh, blonde lady, blue eyes, had a four-year-old child with her. And she walked around the table and looked at the pictures, and she said words to the effect, excuse me, sir, but I have to ask a stupid question. Uh, why are all those people black? Everyone in the pictures are black. And uh, Jean, being a retired uh, educator, uh, <laughs> said, well, let me tell you a story. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. And he said words to the effect, uh, when I taught children and a child said, uh, I have a stupid question, a word to the, words to that effect, uh, can you answer it? And Gene would say, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, because when I answer that question, it is no longer stupid. And if you don't ask that stupid question, uh, it'll be stupid or you'll be stupid for the rest of your life as far as that question is concerned. So he said, now let me tell you why all these people are black. So he gave her a one-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball education, why they were all black. Now, she was 30 years old, and as I said, a white female, and apparently she had no idea of the segregated policies of the military and of our wonderful country uh, before she was born. Now, those not, may not be the exact words that would, were used, but that is the idea. Okay, now, flip that coin over. Uh, there's a Italian restaurant that I go to. I love Italian food. And the owner of the restaurant, one day, when I took a friend of mine there for dinner, he said, you know, I grew up in a little village in Italy. And as a boy, I remember the adults, the older people talking, and they said, there are some black pilots, they called them colored pilots at that time, and they came over here to fight the Germans. They brought their own airplanes. They have their own mechanics and crew chiefs. And we think it's wonderful. And he, here he is in America today, and he told me that little story. So that is two sides of the coin. Thanks, John. John is the first, the first black captain to fly passengers over the Pacific. Uh, in that regard, you know, one of the things we wanted our, our, our kids to uh, benefit from all the, first of all, we wanted to have, how are we doing time-wise? I'm running out? Okay. Uh, those of us who, uh, you know, we had wonderful time flying during the war. We enjoyed flying, and we wanted to have continue flying after the war. So uh, a number of guys tried to get jobs as pilots after the war. And John was told that he was too good. He had too much experience to be a pilot. Can you imagine that? They gave you all kinds of crud. But um, believe it or not, you know, the war ended in 1945. It wasn't until 1963 that a black man could get a job flying a, a commercial airplane. 1963. Marlon Green was a Korean War uh, veteran. He was a major. He had three th over 3,000 hours of flying time when he came out of service in 1958. And he made the rounds all over the different airlines trying to get a job. And everybody, nobody's hiring. Everybody's filled up. 
So he bumps into one of his war buddies, and they're, they're talking, uh, you know, over old times, talking about what's going on, how they're getting along. And he tells the guy, look, man, I'd like to get a job flying, but uh, all the airlines are filled. And his buddy said, nah, nah, that's a lot of crud. I know guys that are getting hired left and right. So they set up a test case. A white guy goes into Continental, and he's hired. Marlon Green, with equal or better qualifications, goes to Continental. They're not hiring. They're full. Da 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 da. Another white guy goes into Continental. He's hired. So now they got the now they got the goods. They go to court, and it took five years for this case to wend its way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court finally ruled that Continental was guilty of racial segregation. They were ordered to hire Marlon Green and give him five years back pay. Marlon Green. Marlon Green in 1963 became the first black man to fly for one of the regularly scheduled airlines. After all this heroic stuff that black men have done, you still have to fight every single minute, every single day for every step of progress. Today, things are a tiny bit better, ready for the great economy and people loving to fly. Uh, there's an organization of black airline pilots uh, we had our convention just last week. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen and the Organization of Black Airline Pilots have a joint convention. We consider them our sons. And um, their membership is now 1,071. Now, there are about 60,000 airline pilots in this country, so 1,071, <laughs> less than 1%. But there's progress. Uh, all right, I will. During, during our convention, during the awards banquet, just Saturday evening, uh, they named all of the, ca all the black uh, captains that became captains over the past year. And I'm pretty sure they're, they're well, over, well over 33 or 35 uh, black pilots that became captains in some airline around the country, including um, one black female was mentioned Saturday, but there are more. I, I know that there are, I know there are seven black female captains. There's one in a United Airlines commercial. Um, Melissa Ward, I think her name is. She was the first black captain. But there, there are a number, including black females that are flying the 747 for United Airlines. Uh, I'm a proud papa. Uh, my son was a Marine Corps pilot. He was in the Marine Corps flying A-4s for about four years. No, I'm sorry, seven years. Well, four and seven make 11. I got it. Then he, he, left the Mar he left the Marine Corps and went to American Airlines. He's been with American Airlines now about 10 or 11 years. But he's a captain, and he's flown just about everything that, that American has. Uh, 27s, 37s, Falkers, 67s, 57s, but he's now the manager of American Airlines 777 fleet. America, uh, Boeing makes a 777, and American has something about 15 of them now, and he's the manager of that entire fleet. I had the, the opportunity to go to Boeing's factory in Seattle in January. I went to the factory in Seattle to with my son who took delivery of one of the 777s. Uh, there were 19 people that went. Some people got awards from the company for going and some people were, were a part of the crew. In that group was the finance guy with a check for $123 million to finish the payment. They had made a down payment, but this $123 million finished the payment. And uh, my son was the commander of that flight and we, I was with him from Seattle to uh, Dallas to put that plane in service for uh, American Airlines. He's also the first American Airlines pilot to fly from Chicago over the North Pole to Hong Kong. They do that because it's two hours shorter, plus they don't have the west to east wind to contend with. On the way back, they came with the wind, and his flight set a speed record for a uh, regular uh, scheduled passenger airline. Now, Continental has triple sevens, and there are a number of airlines that have triple sevens, but uh, he's the uh, manager of the American Airlines triple seven fleet. Uh, are there any questions? All right, thank you. Are there any questions about, uh, yes, sir.
Were any of us actually pilots? Yes, I was a pilot, and John Harrison had 10,000 hours as a pilot. It just happens that I was in class 45A. Uh, my class was graduated in March of 45. And when the Germans heard I was coming, they surrendered. The war, <laughs> the war ended in May, and uh, I didn't have to shoot at anybody. Huh? Now, John was not 43K, and he was 44F. Uh, what about Europe? But you were, he was a bomber. Oh, hey, listen, we had four bomber squadrons. Oh, my goodness, that's where John was. He was a bomber pilot. We have four bomber squadrons, the guys who flew B-25s. We had 125 navigator bombardiers. The bomber squadrons did not have enough, they weren't fully complemented to go into combat. Tuskegee was the only place where they were trained black pilots, and Tus Tuskegee wasn't large enough to put out the number of pilots that were needed to uh, send replacements over to Europe and outfit the bomber squadron. Most white fighter pilots, after 50 missions, they went home. We did not have enough replacements to keep the squadrons uh, filled, so our guys flew many more than 50 missions. There's a guy in our, our group, in the Philadelphia group, Luther Smith, lives in, um, what's the little town, uh, Villanova? Villanova? He lives in Villanova. He was, his plane, he was knocked down on his 134th mission. And he was knocked down by, by uh, stuff, you know, you shoot up a tank or something, the thing explodes, and the shrapnel can, uh, you know, damage your airplane. Well, Luther was knocked down on his 134th mission. White pilots rotated back after 50 missions. And many, I don't think, you probably wouldn't find a, a pilot in the uh, group that flew less than 50 missions. So this is what happens as a result. The country loses out. But we did have four, the four bomber squadrons. They blew, flew B-25s. And uh, we have navigators, bombardiers, gunners, and all that to go with it. Any others? No, I was just, I was just gonna say we're gonna, it, we could keep on going, I'm sure, for yes, a long time here. But uh, one rule is that when the lights are out, we're supposed to be out. And the, <laughs> lights, go, <laughs> the lights go out at 9 o'clock. Um, before we uh, finish, maybe we'll have time for uh, a question or two, but uh, for the last several months, we've, um, our, uh, for quite a while, we've had a raffle going on. We've got donation envelopes back there that if you put your name and your phone number and a donation in there, you get into the raffle. And the item that we have been expecting to raffle off, uh, Jack Boucher, one of our former speakers, a tin can sailor, is also an excellent uh, in his wood shop, and this is a jewelry box that uh, he made and donated, and uh, we're going to raffle that off tonight to the people that have uh, donated over the last several times by way of envelopes. Now, we have had many people donating straight folding change without using envelopes, and uh, we appreciate that also. If you want to get into the raffle for whatever we might have in the future, use the donation envelopes. Uh, you can put um, any amounts from a dollar up. Dollars are nice, fives are better, tens and twenties are wonderful. So uh, we do have expenses for the program here, and we're also trying to raise money to buy a video camera. We're using a borrowed video camera from our church, from my church, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, where we started the program. And um, uh, we'd uh, love to be able to have the new facilities here have a camera. And uh, all we got to do is find the money. It would be in the order of $1,000. So anybody that wants to uh, participate in that, be sure you let me know. Uh, without spending much time on it, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Richardson if he'll pick at random one envelope from here. Some of these were donations where they didn't put their name on it. So it may be that a no name will get it, in which case we'll have another drawing. So Dr. Richardson, would you uh, find one okay, yeah, in here? That... This one looks good. All right, that's it, just pull it up. Okay, uh, this one is uh, C.G. Copeland. You've contributed a lot of times. Are you here tonight? C.G. Copeland. I've got his phone number. I'll have to get in touch with him. Who's here that knows him? I do. Okay. 
All right, you might tell him, and I'll contact him also. Uh, he's the winner of this uh, nice little jewel box. Uh, somebody said, I guess Jack said, that it's good for your girlfriend or your wife or whatever. So that's it for that. Uh, just a moment or two for if there's any particular question someone has, let's see if we can cover it. In the back row. Yes. Here you want yes. a mic? Uh, her picture is great. Here's your mic. Here's your mic. Yeah, Eleanor Roosevelt's picture is on one of the uh, boards in the back. Uh, she was with Charles Alfred Anderson. The movie, I Give a 90. Uh, that movie was written by one of our guys, Robert Williams, who was, uh, got his wings in 1944 sometime. Uh, he flew with the one, I think he shot down two, two planes himself. He wrote the story when he came out of service in 1945 or 46. You know, it took 40 weeks to go through flying school. 40 weeks to go through, but every five weeks they would start a new class. So he wrote the story about his group of guys, his class, as they assembled from civilian life to Tuskegee and through the flying program. I give the movie a 90. Now in the movie, uh, they had Eleanor Roosevelt out of sequence. In the movie, they were Eleanor Roosevelt was asking the question, why aren't these men overseas in combat? Well, Eleanor Roosevelt was there before anybody flew anything at Tuskegee. Remember, she was there uh, at representing the Judas Rosenwald Fund that allotted money for them to build the airfield on which Tuskegee Airmen had their primary flying. After primary, we went to a military airfield about, I don't know, seven or eight miles away in another direction, and we had our advanced, basic and advanced flying training there. Uh, another part in that movie, uh, somebody, some guy crashed. The guy was being eliminated because he buzzed the field or did something and he dove down and crashed. We don't know of anything like that ever, ever happening. I did meet a guy that claims that he was the pilot that landed near some prisoners. Now, that's the only verification I get of that. Some guy saying he was the one. And it wasn't an AT-6, it was a BT-13. Yeah, well, she flew with Alfred Anderson, yes, uh-huh, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. does, does he understand that there was uh, the Tuskegee Institute and the Tuskegee Air Force flying field? Okay, there were two. Uh, Tuskegee University, prior, in those days, was known as Tuskegee Institute. Tuskegee Institute was had the contract for primary flying, which was 60 hours, I believe. I think we had 60 hours, and all, all of our primary instructors were black. Uh, well, a famous one was Chappie James, who became a four-star general. He was one of our primary instructors. If you were lucky to get out of primary, then you went to the military base for basic flying, which was another 60 hours or so. And if your luck held out, you went to the advanced flying school. And if that luck held out, then you got your wings and bars. But Tuskegee University was just a part. One of the, and on that picture, there's a section of it that's in color. That is the actual building that we, uh, that was our barracks, our quarters where we were stationed.